We finished the last video with the reign of terror. Reign of terror, which lasted essentially from April, April of 1793 to July of 1794, where Robespierre himself got the losing end of the guillotine. So it looks like France was done with the low point of the revolution. And that is true, especially from the point of view of the French people. Then we go into 1795. 1795. France is doing well in its wars with essentially the rest of Europe. And peace is declared with Prussia and Spain. Peace with Prussia. Prussia and Spain. So the only two major enemies left are Great Britain and Austria. So slowly, Aust France is dealing with its enemies. And this was essentially a victory for France. So France victorious. France victorious with this huge citizen army that it created. And then this was in April of 1795. This is April. And then in August of 1795, let me do that in a different color. In August of 1795, the new Republic Constitution gets approved. And it gets ratified through a vote of the people. So Constitution, Constitution, the new Constitution ratified, which makes France officially a republic. They don't need kings anymore. And it set up a governing structure where the executive was essentially this group of five directors. So the executive was called the directory. So you don't have one president. You had five directors. Five directors. And then the legislature, and this was significant because this was the first bicameral legislature for France, legislature. It had two houses. It had the Council of 500, which is analogous to the US House of Representatives. And it had 500 members in it, 500 representatives. Let me write that down. It was bicameral. It had two houses, just like the US Congress. So it's Council of 500. And then you had your Council of Elders. Council of Elders, which had 250 representatives. And that, if you want to view it from a US point of view, that was analogous to the US Senate. And the directory, the directors, the candidates were picked by the Council of, or they were submitted by the Council of 500 to the Council of Elders, who then picked the five directors, the five people who would essentially be the executive in France. So already, things are looking, looking really well. But even though they had the military victories, there was still a lot of unrest. You still had royalists out there. You still had Great Britain causing trouble. Great Britain was attacking the western regions of France. There were royalists throughout Paris. And then in October of 1795, so we're now in October, October of 1795, there was a royalist uprising, and royalists are the people who wanted to bring back the crown, or they were against the revolutionary government. And to a large degree, they weren't just upset about the fact that the royalty is gone. They were also upset that they were excluded from the directory. So it excluded the royalists. So before the directory could even form in any major sway, you had a royalist uprising in Paris. Royalist uprising in Paris. And they stormed the Tuileries. This is the same place that you might remember earlier on, a couple of videos ago, where the king and queen were in house arrest. And later, they were assaulted by the revolutionary government. That was this painting right here. This was only three years ago. This was in 1792. And this is when they actually took the king and queen uh, a prisoner. And then they executed uh, Louis the Sixteenth only a few months after that. So now it was on the other way. Instead of the, the royalty being in the Tuileries and being sieged by the revolutionaries, the revolutionary government was in the Tuileries, and it was being sieged by royalists. And actually, the, th the, the situation did not look good for the revolutionary government. They were outnumbered. It looked like the royalists had better numbers. Better, better numbers. But lucky for the revolutionary government, there was a young, very ambitious, very egotistical general, well, not the general, military captain at this point, at, 
who had observed the siege of the Tuileries when the when when Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette were captured. And over the and back then he made mental note. He said, "Boy, you know, they would have been able to stop the siege if only they had good artillery." Remember, he was an artillery captain. That's where he first became famous in the siege. In the siege of Toulon, he was able to use artillery effectively to suppress a rebellion. So he was actually ob- observing this scene three years later, and now in 1795, as the revolutionary government is in the Tuileries and the royalists are about to essentially take it over, Napoleon, using what he learned when he observed the first time, he was able to place cannons and artillery in such a way, and he shot what they call grape shot. And it's essentially like a shotgun coming out of a cannon. And even though they were significantly outnumbered by the royalists, he was essentially able to mow them down with the cannons. So even though you had more numbers, you had all these cannons. Let me draw one. You know, you had a cannon, and the actual ammunition would have these little pellets. That's why it was called grape shot. It looked like a bundle of grapes. And when you shot it out, it would go in every direction. So you could imagine it would just mow down whoever's in the way of the cannon. And so essentially, Napoleon was able to save the revolutionary government and allow the actual directory and allow the actual directory to come to power. So this, once again, Napoleon was in the right place at the right time, and he was very competent at military tactics. You know, by all measure, he was egotistical, he was narcissistic, but the dude knew what he was doing. And so Napoleon. Napoleon becomes even more famous. This event, October 5th, 1795, where Napoleon is able to defend the revolutionary government. This is known as 13 Vendemiari, or I know I'm saying it wrong, but once again, this was the month of October in the new French revolutionary calendar, but it made Napoleon even more of a national hero. Napoleon or even revolutionary hero, national hero. People are starting to realize that this guy, he definitely knows what he's doing. But you could imagine at the same time, the directory really didn't like this dude hanging around too close to the seats of power. He was obviously ambitious. He was obviously competent. And at some point, he might be a threat himself to the directory. So they gave him power, but he made sure they made sure that he was far away from France. So he's essentially put in charge of the campaign into Italy. So Napoleon gets put in charge. Remember, we're still fighting Austria and Great Britain. So we're fighting Austria and Italy and Napoleon is made he's a commander in chief of the Italian forces. And he's tremendously successful. This was kind of the least important front of the war with Austria at this point. But out of all of the generals of the different fronts, Napoleon is the one that proves himself to be tremendously, tremendously uh, innovative and tactical and an all out good general. So this is Napoleon kicking butt in Italy. Napoleon in Italy. So once again, he becomes even more famous, even more well known. Eventually, Australia, sorry, eventually Austria, eventually Austria admits that, hey, gee, we're not going to beat the French anymore. They're they're really, you know, uh, taking care of us quite well, and they make peace. They make peace with the French in October of 17. 97 the italian campaign occurred in 1796 so you know he he defended the revolutionary government in 1795 he kicks butt in 1796 in italy in 1797 the austrian there's peace with austria so you only have great britain left but this peace with austria is actually going to be very temporary peace with austria this is from the treaty of campo formio write that down. This is the Treaty of Campo for Mio. And once again, this was peace with Austria, but France was the victor. So this is another French victory. And the only real enemy left was Great Britain. But the main problem was is Great Britain had the dominant navy in the world at the time. So uh, it, it, the France, and especially Napoleon, wasn't in a position to confront Great Britain on the water. So 
And this is kind of a controversial decision. In 1798, and remember, the director really didn't want Napoleon hanging around France. They're just like, OK, you're hugely popular. You're a good general. You're a great general. You go do what you want, whatever you think is proper. So Napoleon gets it into his head to attack Egypt. And people aren't 100% sure what was the main strategic goal of attacking Egypt. So in 1798, he, le he leaves from Toulon. Remember, Toulon was the port that he helped suppress. He leaves from Toulon. He takes Malta along the way. And then, eventually, he arrives in Egypt to essentially take over Egypt. And people believe that his desire to take over Egypt was uh, essentially to, at some point, undermine the British in India. He maybe makes some Muslim allies in Egypt, and then maybe befriend some of the Muslim insurgents, if you will, who do, who are against, especially they were talking about Tipu Sultan, who he wanted to meet up with and maybe help undermine the British in India. But people aren't quite sure. It might have been just uh, Napoleon having some visions of grand, grandeur, and he wanted to go to, to Egypt because e Egypt was a formerly you know, uh, great empire. So in 1798, Napoleon goes to Egypt. These are paintings of him in Egypt. And he once again, he was able to kind of rout the, 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 the forces, the Mamluk forces, who are in power at, time, at the time of Egypt. This is the Battle of the Pyramids. Once again, Napoleon is hugely successful, except for one problem. He brings his 20,000 troops into Egypt, obviously by ship. They're sitting here, they're, in, you know, they're kicking butt in Egypt, but where they're still at war still at war with the British. So what the British do with their dominant navy, they send Horatio Nelson in charge of a fleet. And he comes here where the French navy was parked. And he just destroys them. So Horatio Nelson destroys the French fleet in the Battle of the Nile. And this is a depiction. This is Horatio Nelson right here. Horatio Nelson. This is a depiction of the Battle of the Nile. Battle of Nile, which essentially strands Napoleon's 20,000 person army. They're stuck in Egypt. They're stuck in Egypt. So not knowing what else to do, they can't leave with, with all of their forces. Napoleon then goes into Damascus and Syria, and then he causes all sorts of havoc and raping and pillaging and, and whatnot. But still, that kind of begs the question of, how are they going to get back? And you can imagine, for someone as ambitious and egotistical as Napoleon, he didn't really care a lot about what happened to his troops. And so when, when an opportunity arose in 1799, he left. He left his whole, he left his entire army. This gives you a lot of a, a, a view into Napoleon's character that he was willing to leave his entire army in Egypt and in Syria to essentially be left to die at the hands of the Ottomans. And then he goes back, he sneaks his way back to France. So in 1799, Napoleon goes back to France. This is in 17. 99. Napoleon goes back to France. Let me write this down. 1799. Napoleon back in France. And once he gets back there, he sees that the directory is unbelievably popular. Unpopular. The directory unpopular. And the main reason is the reason that every government in France throughout these, this whole series of videos has been unpopular. People are still hungry. France is still poor. Notice, in everything I've talked about in all of these videos, we still haven't addressed the issue uh, that the France is essentially broke and that people are still going hungry. So throughout all of the violence, all of the wars, the directory is hugely unpopular. And then a few of the directors, two in particular, actually three of the directors, want to plot with Napoleon, who is hugely popular. And they essentially plan a coup. And the way that they allow themselves to come to power is they resign. And then they tell the legislature that's meeting at the Tuileries, they tell the legislature, hey, there's a Jacobian revolt, and you're in danger. Why don't you go to this estate west of Paris? So that's Paris, where they normally meet. They tell them to go to an estate west of Paris. So the legislature goes here to this estate, and you will be protected by Napoleon. Legislature. 
and they're protected by Napoleon and his army. So they're protected by Napoleon. Now, once they're there, Napoleon goes in and starts making these speeches about you guys being essentially illegitimate, and he looks like he really wants to take power. And they just jostle him out of the room. But once he gets jostled out of the room, his brother points to the, 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 the bruises on Napoleon. He's, he tells the, the guards outside of, outside of where the legislature is meeting, hey, those guys in there, they're becoming violent. You have to go, there, go in there and take orders. So the, that convinces the military. And they go in, and they essentially dissolve the Council of 500. So essentially, you've dissolved the legislature. Napoleon is in charge of the military that dissolved the legislature. And so that allowed Napoleon and two of the plotting directors to take power. They became the three consuls, three consuls of France. They formed the consulate, or the new executive of France. And very shortly, they'll have their own constitution. But this really marks the point where Napoleon takes power of France. Because even though he took power with these other two dudes, he eventually is able to uh, uh, scheme his way to be called First Consul. So Napoleon eventually is able to call himself First Consul, at which point he is the authoritarian ruler of France. So we've gone from, over the course of the French Revolution, from 1789, from 1789, where we had an absolute monarch in Louis the 16th. Now we go all the way to 1799, 10 years later, after all of this bloodshed, bloodshed after multiple revolutions and counter-revolutions, we end up with Napoleon essentially being in charge of France.